You're listening to Beyond Technique, the podcast that empowers photographers to bring their businesses to the next level. Hello and welcome to Beyond Technique, brought to you by Platypod, Photo Focus, and Skip Cohen University. This is Shamira Young and I am joined by my co-host Skip Cohen. Skip! Hey! What's up? I hear we are again. Here we this are. Is, this is great. These are. This is a great time to be doing a podcast and one of the best because as we slowly come out of, oh, I, I'm crossing my fingers here. You don't want to jinx it, but as we slowly <laughs> come out of the pandemic and the craziness of the last year, this is yes. a fun place to be today. And man, so, do we have a good guest today. Yeah, we do. And I'll bet you that's my cue to introduce him. Yes, do the honors. So it's this is the perfect time and the perfect guest to talk about the importance of diversifying your skill set and life in the crazy lane. Frederick Van Johnson is in the house. Now, if you don't know him, he's a photographer, he's an artist, he's a podcaster, and he's a friend to so many of us in the industry. He's also the ultimate tech weenie. So I'm in trouble with both him and Shamara on the same show today. <laughs> Many of you know him from his hosting of This Week in Photo, various Lumix events, or just catching up to him back in the days when we all got to go to conventions. Hint, hint. Can't wait for that first one to come where we all feel safe again. We're going to spend some time talking about the industry, things you should all be doing to get ready for getting back to business. And as usual, we never know what's going to come up to talk about along the way. So, buddy, if I haven't screwed up technology, this is the cue for your lips to move. Awesome. Thank you both for having me on. It's, I got to say, it's weird doing this, not looking at you, but also uh, being on this side of the mic because <laughs> normally I'm on the other side and interviewing you guys. And now I get to sit back and, and relax and answer questions. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited to talk. Well, it's good to have you here. And for those of you listening, the reason that we don't do video one is sometimes they just get to be talking heads depending on what we're doing. But more importantly, we tend to get a really good quality audio using just Skype audio, which is what we recorded. So didn't mean to give Skype a plug there, but they got it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is going to be a good one. And oh, Frederick, it is so cool to have you on the show, not just to kept, catch up with you, but also to hear how you've been doing and how you've been I guess for a lack of lack of a better term, coping with everything going on the last year, or let's say thriving. We want to hear how you're thriving. And before we get into that, though, just for those listeners who may be living under a rock, may not know who you are, can you tell us about your journey and how you got started in the photography industry and how you ended up doing what you're doing today? Sure, absolutely. Um, cue the Beatles music because it's a long and winding road. So it's, <laughs> but I'll start. I'll, I'll I'll keep it short. I'll give you the Reader's Digest version of it. Um, so the the beginnings was the United States Air Force. So that's that's where I I started. I guess my career uh, in in digital imaging and photography. I was a combat photojournalist. I did that for eight years in the U.S. Air Force, um, left the Air Force and continued that streak in Silicon Valley, doing still doing creative stuff. I, I worked for a company in, in Silicon Valley called the San Jose Mercury News, and I held a position that was, you know, kind of a cool title back then called web designer. Remember that? So I was, <laughs> that was my wow. first out of the military gig was web designer. And then I convinced the the publisher to upgrade my title to creative director of uh, of online because I was in charge of all online stuff for the newspaper, which then became this, the the leg of the the newspaper called the the uh, Mercury Center. So I was managing all that stuff, and then. I got the bug, you know, this is Silicon Valley. I got the bug of, hey, we're reporting on all these cool, interesting companies uh, and all these kids making millions of dollars. And, you know, they're like right over there. And I want to be in that. I don't want to be talking about it. I want to be in there. So uh, I joined Yahoo. I was one of the early employees at Yahoo, luckily, and stuck with them. And then, you know, bounced to, I'm just skipping over giant swaths, but Left Yahoo, went to Apple, left Apple, went to Adobe, and then started my own thing, which is kind of where I am right now. Still doing this podcast media creation thing. And the whole, the whole idea behind This Week in Photo was 
the when I left Adobe, that was that was part of their layoffs. They had layoffs back in the day. Skip, I don't know if you remember. They had they laid off like 800 people in one day, and I got I wow. was caught up in that toilet flush, right? And uh, you know, licking my wounds, I was thinking. I remember sitting at home thinking, man, this sucks. You know, having having all your eggs in one basket and having someone be able to make a decision overnight that will fundamentally impact your very existence is not the way that I want to live. So I, I jumped on a spreadsheet and started building what I called Operation Fireproof. Like, how do you build something so that you can withstand and not have to worry about getting fired every quarter or laid off or something? So that's, that was the impetus of TWIP, you know, using my photography kind of knowledge. And uh, in fact, TWIP, This Week in Photo, in its previous iteration, was started by two friends of mine, Scott Bourne and Alex Lindsay. They started it and then went on to, you know, other things. And I took it over and grew it from a couple of hundred podcast listeners to, you know, where we are now, thousands and thousands. So... You know, that's that's kind of where it is. And I got I got a chance to take my marketing learnings from Adobe, Apple, Yahoo, et cetera, and focus them on taking this fledgling brand at the beginning of podcasting and and kind of make it into an adult, you know, take it from a, a hobby ship in the bottle to an actual submarine and take it out and actually drive revenue. So that's that's kind of where we are now. It's funny when you talked about the layoff at Adobe, I got caught in a couple of them in my Polaroid days. And we used to have a standard line, which you just said to everybody you were working with, listen, I'm going to lunch. If my boss calls, tell him to tell me who he is. I mean, exactly. the organizational ch changes and, and the line, the line is obviously comes out male because we're going way, way, way back. Mm -hmm. Um, but these days with layoffs and changes, um, I think one of the things that, that it has happened so repeatedly is that people just don't know what to do. The pandemic has created an individual layoff for virtually every person that had a job in, in, in the world. No matter what you're doing, you've been affected somehow by the pandemic, um, unless you work at Zoom. <laughs> and then, yeah, and then, even then, you're affected. Yeah. You're just rich now. Yeah, you're rich now. <laughs> But let's 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 go into the first direction that I'd love to go in because one of your trademarks is relationship building, yeah. and I'd love to talk about some of those things that happened during the pandemic because people think that hunkering down means they've got to disappear, and you don't disappear. Hunkering down is about your health. It's not about all the different ways you can keep building relationships. And I'm I just love to hear some of the things that you've been doing over the last year where we talked to everybody before the podcast about about Fredericks, what he's been doing and and he and his family have been hunkered down like like Sheila and I and like Shamara and Troy and we've all been hunkered down. So what are you doing to stay in touch with everybody and what's going on out there? That's a great question. You know, it's interesting because because of the nature of online businesses, which is essentially what I run, because of the nature of that not much has changed in terms of business for me. In fact, it's it's kind of like, you know, I was a settler on a new planet and now everyone is on this planet trying to figure it out. And I've been here for like five years trying to, you know, and I figured out how to make water and communicate and all that stuff. So, you know, the analogy or the analog is working from home now in a pandemic is essentially the same as working when there is no pandemic with the the obvious kind of change of there's no human to human you know interaction there are no conferences like we were talking about skip none of that stuff it is it's all most of it is zoom based now the the challenge for me came in was that came in was a this influx of opportunity right because i'm an online guy i do stuff online i present online i know how to light and mic and you know all this stuff i'm very familiar with all the tools so suddenly i became kind of you know, a go-to person, at least for, for tech support and some other things. And there's a ton of opportunities that popped up. But then on the, on the other side of it is managing all of that because it was, you know, an influx of stuff to do. Um, and then now family's home as well. So my modality over the last several years was, 
okay, everybody's gone. Cameron's at school. Nicole's at work. Now, you know, I roll out of bed around nine and roll into my office and get started with my day, which goes to about 1 a.m. Normally, all that shifts. All that shifts because now there's people in the house and there's homeschooling and there's noise and pots clanking. I can't record content, you know, all this stuff's going on. So that was that was my adjustment, you know, or our adjustment to sort of figure out, okay, how do we coexist in the same space that I've been doing for, you know, a decade or so. So that that was disruptive for me. But then we figure we figured that out. The other side of it was like you mentioned, Skip, was health. Um I, you know, the stress, you don't, you don't really realize, or I didn't really realize the extent of the impact of the constant barrage of negative news and just, you know, family issues and trying to run a business and making money and doing these meetings. And it's just, it's a pressure cooker that I wasn't addressing properly. I, I don't think. And the missing thing was just leaving the house and walking around and getting fresh air and, you know, so what I did to circumvent that a couple months ago, I just started walking like five to seven di- miles a day. Every day I go out and I just walk five to seven miles at a really clip, a really fast kind of house music EDM pace, right? And I just, I do it. I come back, jump in the shower, back to work, and I'm a new person after that. I wish I had been doing this for a decade, but now, you know, everything seems better and more manageable when you introduce that sort of thing into your your daily routine. So on the relationship side, relationships are they're they're better. I've I've reached out and been able to connect with more people because everyone is trapped, right? So now I it, I could reach out to people that I ordinarily would have had a hard time getting to commit to a podcast interview or something. And now suddenly they're excited and available that they get to do something and actually you know, jump online. So it's been, it's been, you know, I I don't want to use the word positive because obviously there's the, there's nothing positive about a pandemic, but the, the silver lining in the cloud has been the fact that I've, I've already been doing this stuff. It wasn't a shift, a, a too radical a shift of me, for me to make in order to, you know, kind of move into this, this lockdown modality, you know, with, with, with the understanding that with family comes lots of distractions and all that. But then the other positive was just the availability of people and being able to build more relationships than I had before because of everything is remote now. And that's sort of, at least for this past year plus has been the accepted way that people communicate. So it's, it's been, it's been interesting and it continues to be interesting. I'm curious as to whether or not you'd agree with me. I have found that I can find virtually anybody these days by dialing the phone and the Mm -hmm. phone had kind of disappeared. I mean, we were texting and we email and then we were at the beginning of this, it was all zoom. If I want to talk to somebody or somebody want to talk, wants to talk to me, it's rare (laughs) when my phone rings, this is an exciting moment. It's like, all right, it's somebody to talk to because we're all in that position or most of us are in that position where we are working out of our homes and the fun of any interaction at, at the water cooler or, I mean, Larry Becker, who's, who a lot of people know from uh, mm-hmm. Kelby Media Days. I mean, Larry lives about an hour and a half away. We've got a favorite restaurant we meet at in the middle and we catch up to, for lunch at least once a month. And that disappeared. Yeah. So have you found the phone um, to be even more useful these days? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And just just having those kinds of yeah, I think any kind of real human to human interaction beyond, you know, content creation or being online and social media and all that stuff is I think the one of the the net effects of the pandemic is has it has raised that up again. So now we are everybody's sitting at the edge of their seats waiting to book tickets to go places. And I think when we go even to simple things like sitting at a cafe or something with with a friend that you haven't talked to in a while is cherished now. Right. It's like, you know, it's just now it now feels like we've taken all this stuff for granted. You don't know what you have until it's gone. Right. And now the the entire world have has experienced loss in some way, whether it's you know, friends or family or just time or just a shift in income, 
there's been a loss that's that's hit the planet globally. And I think when that starts coming back, the planet collectively will be more appreciative of the good things that they have versus, you know, taking it for granted. I know I am. So when someone someone texted me earlier in the the message, the be- messages that I get now are, hey, have you had your vaccines? Let's go out and get drinks. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, no, I haven't had it yet. I'm still, I'm still sidelined, right? So, but it's exciting that those are starting to come now. It's not, it's it, it before. If I'd gotten a message like that a month ago or so, that would have been a joke. Like, what are you? Are you ridiculous? I don't want to die to have a drink with you. And now, now it's different, right? And now it's like, okay, it's plausible. Let's go. You know, if I could go, I'd go. You know, this great. This is this is kind of a discussion on gratitude and I love that you're highlighting this this element of appreciating what we used to take for granted Frederick and and you're right it is absolutely a silver lining when we're able to get back together again we're going to be so much more grateful for being able to see people face to face and spend time with people and it's just it's really these are really interesting times but i'm curious my next question is actually the perfect question for you with you having been online before the pandemic ever started what skill sets would you say photographers need to brush up on or how should they expand their skill set in order to readjust to these new times where we're on zoom or maybe before they only had to worry about photo sessions and now they have to worry about looking good on camera themselves for a zoom meeting um what should they be doing to diversify their skill set to best move their photography business forward that's a really good question uh i think you hit it right on the head it's it's the appearance on camera is paramount I think it's important these days. Last year, let's say, or or BC before COVID, it was, it was you know okay, you know the the online stuff is an afterthought. Even even with conferences, you know the online version, you pay a little extra, you can get the recordings that were made from the back of the room or something like that. Um, the for people whose primary primary profession is either content creation or or digital imaging or imaging, I think it's a crime for you to show up on camera as anything less than the work that you represent. Kind of like a real estate agent. You know, all real estate agents, they show up in these fancy cars because they want to represent that they, they, you know, they have, they make money. You know, they're successful. They want to show success. Or, you know, a, a, a cobbler showing up with ratty shoes, right? As a photographer, you need to show up with, and look great on camera, and it doesn't take that much to to look great on camera. Is as an image maker, it's lights, right? Lights in the camera. If you can kind of dial those in, uh, and your microphone, obviously for for decent audio, that that trifecta instantly puts you a level up. When people see your stuff, they see your video, and you come on camera, whether it's a Zoom meeting or whatever, or a webinar that you're participating in. You need to pay attention to everything in your scene and not treat it as, well, you know, I'm a great photographer. I, I, I could just use this cheap Best Buy webcam and get by with it. You can get by, but even if no one says anything, they, you know, and they may not, they may not notice and care that your quality is, is low, you know, because of the, the substance of the conversation. But if you come with amazing broadcast quality, then they're going to, it's going to be kind of like that real estate agent showing up in a Lexus or a, or a, a Mercedes, right? It's like, oh, that person must at least know what they're doing because they're, they bothered to show up and, and look amazing, right? So I think it's, remember that, that would be the first thing is people that are in the content creation and photography or image making field, lean into it, you know, make dial in your setup, you know, and don't make it an afterthought. That would be number one. The number two thing is with things moving online and online businesses becoming kind of the norm, you know, even if it's just working from home, if you work for a giant corporation and you're working from home, you're kind of doing an online business. You're doing Zoom meetings, you're working on the computer, you're chatting, you're slacking, you're doing all that stuff. That's kind of what an online business is. So I would kind of take a page out of the book that I had. When, once, I, once I got laid off from Adobe, I started this, when I said Operation Fireproof, part of Operation Fireproof was to compartmentalize my income and shift my mindset from, you know, I am, 
I am a soldier in this company until the day that I leave this company. You know, it's rah, 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 cut me and I bleed the company colors, right? It shifted from that to, I want to look at these companies that I, whether I work for them as a contractor or if I take a full-time employment gig with one of these, these companies, I will always look at them as a revenue source, or a client, you know, or a contract. Even if it's a full-time employment gig, on my spreadsheet, it shows up as a revenue re revenue source that can be replaced with another revenue source if it should go away. So that mindset, kind of like the, I think, I'm, and it's not new. Like this mindset is, I think it was drilled into my head by Tim Ferriss in the Four Hour Work Week or one of his Four Hour books or something. But it was just kind of that thinking, thinking from the standpoint of this business is not here to do you any favors. This business is here. This corporation that you're working for is not here to do you favors. It's there to make money and satisfy its shareholders. So you should treat them as such, treat them as a contract. And even in your head, you don't have to tell them that, but treat them as a contract and add additional revenues, additional revenue streams to your portfolio of revenue. So if you get hit with one, like a giant layoff, and you still have car payments, mortgages, child, yeah, all this other stuff going on that you need to pay, it's not going to sting as much. And it also serves to give you, you know, what we used to call, you know, I won't say it on the podcast, we used to call it FU money, <laughs> where... <laughs> you you have the ability to it changes the conversation when you when you have your own sort of engines that are working and you're no longer be held into the MBA that is that happens to be your boss. Now you're there of your own volition and you're there because you want to be there, not because you are you're being held hostage by your rent or your mortgage payment. You're there because you want to be there. And it changes the the dynamic of the conversation with with everyone, because you know, you're, they know that you could walk if you wanted to. And the reason that you're there is because you believe in what they're doing. So that, that would be my, my advice is to kind of shift that mindset a little bit and also, you know, show up, show up on camera and, and show up like you were creating images that you wanted to put in a contest or something. You just hit on a couple things there that I want to comment on. <clears throat> First of all, Larry Becker has a book called Great on Camera. Um, just mm. Google Larry Becker in um, on Amazon and you'll find the book, but then also JP Morgan did a video on the slanted lens about looking good on camera. I am mm. so tired of going into zoom meetings, even with people that are not photographers where they haven't adjusted their screen. They've got their phone on the desk. I'm either looking up their nostrils or we've only got the top of their head, like the old, uh, Kilroy, um, yeah. cartoon. I mean, it's just yeah. ridiculous. So take the time. I love that about, about, God, look good on camera. You're meeting with you're meeting with clients, vendors. You're in Zoom meetings. You don't know who's at, who else is there that may have the need for a photographer. You might as well look the part. But the other part that you just I started thinking about um, Operation Fireproof. When the pandemic hit, everybody panicked. I don't know what it was like in Northern California, but we went to Publix and you were limited. You could only buy one dozen eggs. Um, toilet paper couldn't be found, paper goods, paper towels couldn't be found. Um, people were buying, I mean, stocking up on everything. And yet when it comes to business, so few people thought about stocking up on skills, on making sure they kept in touch with their network, for example, during the pandemic, making sure that their phone lists were up to date, um, cleaning up their, their email bases so that you really can think of your network almost like the rings on a target where as you move out from the bullseye, um, closer to the bullseye, because the bullseye is each of us, and as you move in those rings out, each ring represents another level of skill set or people that you value. Your closest ones would be those people that you're confiding in all the time or um, associates in your business or your spouse um, or family, some other family member. And then you move out to the next ring and it might be vendors that you work with. And that's another piece of it. Your concept of fireproofing, it works so well when you start thinking about the pandemic and we're all very optimistic now and we've got a right to be, we've earned the right to be optimistic um, after the last 12 months we've all experienced, but you never know when craziness is going to happen again in the future. And I love the idea of everybody thinking about 
how do I make myself fireproof going forward in terms of my business and my skill set? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That yeah. was a very long-winded comment. I apologize. <laughs> no, it's great. It's it's 100% true. You have to it's a it's a subtle shift. It was for me it was an interesting shift because I've coming from the military, you know, I've just kind of been designed to be a team player, right? <laughs> so it's all about team players and you know, supporting the constitution and all that. That's, that's where I kind of quote grew up. Right. And then you leave that and join a corporation, which is very much like another military organization, you know, a lot of the same moving parts, but you know, you, the, the takeaway is to shift the mindset away from that. You're no longer a soldier. You're now you're a mercenary. You have to act like a mercenary in this world because you never know when another COVID is going to come or some other calamity that is going to impact you or your family that if that will that will reduce your ability to make income in the way that you've been accustomed to over the past 20 plus years. So if you think about it now, almost like insurance, if you think about it now and make the assumption that eventually this company is going to shift and is going to no longer be in need of my services and I need to be ready for when that happens, let's, what do I do to make that happen? Okay, let's start an online business. Maybe I need to you know, figure out what this Facebook marketing stuff is all about. Maybe I need to build an email list and start capturing leads there instead of having them all live on, on Instagram or Facebook. You know, so it's it's those kinds of mindset shifts. Once you start shifting and you th start thinking that you're a mercenary versus just a soldier in an army, now things start lining up like, OK, now I need to do this, this and this to kind of make sure that I'm ready for the next thing that comes down the pipe. You know, I'd be really curious to hear about, you touched a bit on what you were doing to cope. So mental health wise, staying sane mentally, yeah. because if you're not healthy mental health wise, then your business will suffer. Not to mention your family life, everything will suffer. And you mentioned earlier that you hadn't realized the toll, the constant negative barrage of news was taking on you or everything going on. And then you realized that you actually needed to get out away from the media away from everything to calm yourself down with these walks. Are there any other tips that you might have for our listeners in order to maintain a healthy, to stay mentally healthy, but also to maintain a good family work life balance through all this? Yeah, well, I'm no, I'm no mental health professional. Nicole, my girl is, which is <laughs> makes it challenging. <laughs> we have somebody that has superpowers and you don't, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> So, you know, it's, it's, I think for me, I'm a, I'm a very hard headed person who was lucky enough to have decent genetics that allowed me for a long span of my life, not to have to worry about what I ate or working out or any of that stuff. I just mm -hmm. looked okay, no matter what. And then, you know, in the later part of my life, the, you know, the curves started going down and the cells <laughs> started doing what they want to do. So, but my brain hadn't shifted yet. So yeah, I could eat whatever I want. And then over time, I just started feeling worse and worse, you know, but my brain is is designed that I want to do more. I want to do all this stuff, all these great ideas, but then I wouldn't feel good. So I wouldn't feel like I wanted to execute this project that I went. I didn't feel like I want to try this new piece of software or this new photography technique because I just didn't feel up to it. I had low energy and all that. So mm -hmm. the way part of the way that I combat it is, like I said, activity, you know, going outside and just getting fresh air and walking and even just waving to passersby on the street is, <laughs> is helpful to see other humans and make eye contact. Um, I picked up a, uh, a Peloton for Nicole for Christmas. So I've been getting on that thing as well. So riding around and getting that level of physical activity when it's raining or something. So we use that a lot. But then it's also diet. So the diet is the, the hard part for me because I'm a Midwestern kid and I like my meat and potatoes. I like steak. <laughs> I like fried food. I like sugary things. I like everything that's bad for me. I love, right? So the hardest thing for me has been to become more adult about the intake <laughs> into my body and understand <laughs> how as much as the outside activity affects me, the internal, the stuff that I put into me affects me. And I, I don't think I'll ever be like 
you know, the the militant person that meal preps and has little portions here and all that stuff. I'm I'm totally not that guy, but I am making an effort towards eating more things that aren't garbage, right? <laughs> so that's that's my commitment to myself. Stop eating garbage. So. <laughs> Well, you make a great point, too. I mean, maintaining your health, that also will help you be more resistant to getting sick physically with the flu yeah. or with COVID or with any other slew of things out there. And it really starts with your health, because if you have crappy health, chances are you're going to have a crappy business. Or like you said, not yeah. feel like you have the energy to do the projects that you want to do moving forward. So that's a really great point. Yeah. Well, the, the other thing I would throw on there, just just real quick, was is the this, the revelation that as I do get older, right? As I as I get older and things start breaking down or wearing out on me, this solopreneur thing that it's taking on a different life because now it's hey, I'm a single point of failure. If I go away, what is affected? You know, and who will have a lower quality of life because? I got hit by a bus or COVID takes me out or something. How do I make sure that when I check out, everybody else that depends on me is okay, right? So that's that's another, and that I didn't even realize how much stress that was until, you know, you, you're this lockdown, right? It's another silver lining in the lockdown. I never realized that, oh, this is, you know, right across the street. There are people, you know, looking at the numbers of, of people that have unfortunately passed away from COVID in my own town, it, it really makes you take a look at your own mortality and what what is going to happen if you are one of those people and you're, you make that mortality rate tick up by one, what happens to people that need you? So that's another thing that people need to start considering as part of Operation Fireproof. Well, I will add that as the as the oldest one of the three of us here, there is something that I have learned. And all those 10-year increments, so you turn 30, you turn 40, you turn 50, you turn 60, and they were, everybody talked about them being milestones. What a time to celebrate. Um, that's, that's a lot of BS. Because <laughs> what happens every 10 years, it's just like that, that day after the warranty expired on your car and the fuel pump went. Or or the brakes went, or something, and you just don't realize it. And it is important to take care of your physical health. But then it's also really important, and, I, and I've learned, and you, you hit on it a minute ago, and when you take your walks, that's a big part of it. But it's also important to recognize that we're all going through the same thing, and when you feel like you're having one of those days where you, when you're going to crash and burn, then that's the time to phone a friend. That's a time to talk to your spouse. That's a time to get back to something that helps you get grounded. And I've seen it over and over again with me and Sheila. She can she can spot. Well, usually it's because I've screamed the F-bomb at the top of my lungs because something just won't work. <laughs> um, early this morning, I had a problem with an Apple mouse and uh, the trackpad wasn't, nothing was working the way it should work. And, and Sheila heard me and I mean, it's sort of like, okay, come on, you know, it's time, time for breakfast, get away from the computer and you just have to learn to walk away from it. And as I babble through that, we're really, we're really out of time, but we have a favorite question we always like to close with, and this is perfect for you. And that's what advice would you give a young or old photographer just starting out in this industry today? Yeah, really, really good question. Um, and I'll be brief. I know I'm long winded. The 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 advice that I, I tend to give people is or we'll, we'll back up a little bit. The question is usually starts with, hey, I'm into I think I like photography. Which camera should I buy? So the the advice on that one is always a triangulation of how much money do you have? Uh, what genre of photography are you interested in? And do you have any friends that have cameras? And if so, what bodies do they have so that you could potentially borrow lenses and things? So that's that answers that question. The other side, if you're just getting started in photography, normally people, the, the path that I've seen, and you both of you have probably seen this as well, is people tend to get online and look at the type of photography that they enjoy or are interested in and look at influencers that are doing things in those areas. And then the next step is to typically buy what they bought. Like if it's a, 
you know, they see Joe McNally doing a bunch of cool shots, lighting an airplane with a bunch of strobe lights. They go buy Nikon gear and strobe lights and try to be Joe McNally. I would caution against that. I would caution that before you start buying gear and before you even start figuring out what your genre is, use the advice, the advice that my mom used to give me when I was a teenager. You got to date before you marry, right? <laughs> so you have to date gear. You have to try out lots of different genres. Maybe you're a portrait photographer who really wants to be a boudoir photographer or vice versa. Maybe you're a landscape photographer who really enjoys wildlife over landscape. So you need to get out there, shoot stuff and process and, and look at the results and see what you gravitate towards. When I was in the military, one of the things that one of my photography instructors used to say was, Everyone is born with a certain number, no one knows the number, but with a certain number of really crappy images in your shutter finger. And the only way to get them out is to press the button. So <laughs> press the button, I love keep that. pressing the button, That's get them crazy. all out of there, and then the good ones will have a chance to see the light of day. Great advice. That's so great, oh my goodness. That's really great. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm still working off my initial lot of bad <laughs> you got a bunch in my there. shutter frame. But that's the other fun thing about digital. At least I'm not waiting for film to come back from the lab to show me. Oops. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. the feedback loop is short now. Oh, yep. my goodness. Oh, Frederick, this has been awesome. Hey, where can folks find you online to check you out? They can all roads lead to thisweekinphoto.com. That's where I am. There you'll find uh, my podcast, our online community, our courses, all. All kinds of stuff. It's all at thisweekinphoto.com. Excellent. We'll make sure to include a link to that in the show notes. And Skip, where can folks find you? It's always the same. Everything I write every day is at skipcohenuniversity.com. Uh, my email is uh, skip at mei500.com. We'd love to hear from you guys with any suggestions or questions you have or ideas for future podcasts. Um, I'm Skip Cohen on Twitter, Skip Cohen on Facebook, and you'll also find both me and Shamira over at Platypod. Um, Shamira is now editing and publishing the monthly newsletter, which is pretty phenomenal, and she also handles the Facebook page and the blog and working together with Hilmar Smith, who's been on TWIP. Um, Hilmar's yes. handling, yeah, a lot of stuff with Instagram. So that's where you'll find all of us. And Shamira, let's go back. Where are they going to find you? Folks can send me an email at shamira at photofocus.com, C-H-A-M-I-R-A at photofocus.com. We love getting questions, ideas, feedback, because it shapes how we move forward with the show. And it absolutely uh, shapes the amazing guests that we have on the show, which makes this show so fun and amazing. And with that said, Frederick, we want to thank you again. This has been awesome. Great stuff You're today, welcome. buddy. You're welcome. Thanks for having me, guys. And we want to thank our listeners for joining us as well. Please tell your friends about this podcast, especially if they have the burning desire to improve their photography business in 2021 and beyond. We look forward to having you all with us next time on Beyond Technique. Brought to you by Platypod, Photofocus, and Skip Cohen University. <laughs>